because you have been a blessing to us. So thank you. Uh, and with that in mind, go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. That's where we're going to pick up our study, a uh, study titled Blueprints, where we've been uh, looking at how the church is to be structured according to the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus. And we're just going to jump right into it this morning. We're going to be in chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. It says this, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. See if you can pick this out from the text because you are intelligent people. For what purpose is this letter to Timothy written? What does he say? For this purpose, these things I write to you. What was the purpose? It's so that we would know how to conduct ourselves in the church of the living God. This is the overarching purpose of why this entire letter is written. If you want to know the context of 1 Timothy, it's right there. So that the people who make up the church would know how to behave. They would know how to do church life. So there we have it. Paul tells us why he's writing. To inform Timothy, to inform the church at Ephesus, and to inform us as readers how the church is to be structured and how we should conduct ourselves in it. What we've kind of said is that this, this letter serves as a blueprint to tell us how to function. It can be broken down into four sections. The message of the church, that the church should never stray from sound doctrine. It should never get distracted from the gospel message. It's the message of the church. That's the first pillar. He outlines it in chapter 1. And in chapter 2, he starts talking about the membership of the church. Who are these people that make up the church? It, godly men, godly women, united in purpose. Among them, there's, there's ministers, there, there's pastors, elders, deacons, there's people that are doing things. But that's, that's the membership. Who is the church? The people. Uh, we haven't got there yet, but that third pillar would be the ministers of the church, kind of in greater detail what these people are supposed to do, and then the fourth pillar, the ministries of the church, just so you can see where we're headed. This morning, we're going to sort of wrap up what the Apostle Paul has to say about the membership of the church, that second pillar. He's gone to great lengths to help us understand the leadership, of, the leadership structure of the church and what, and what that should look like. Remember, he addresses the membership first, and then the spiritual leadership, pastors, elders. He addresses the very practical ways that formal representatives of the church should be serving as deacons, or if you want to use a contemporary term, deaconesses. The passage that we just read, though, takes and summarizes what all of those people who make up the church should be about. What they should be trying to conduct themselves in in a way that's God-glorifying in the life of the church. And in that summary, there's really three analogies to help us understand the church for what it is so that we can conduct ourselves appropriately. And the very first one is that the church is a family. The Apostle Paul says, look, if you want to know how to conduct yourself in the household of God, we need to see the church as a family. Now, for some of us, that's risky because the word family is kind of front-loaded, right? Our families are sort of like fudge, mostly sweet, but kind of nutty. <laughs> W.C. Fields said it this way, all of the men in my family were bearded and most of the women. <laughs> but you'll notice that this passage doesn't say the household of W.C. Fields. It doesn't compare the church to your family either. It's the household of God. The church is to be thought of as God's family, and this has huge implications, practical, everyday implications for how we will live in relationship to each other. 
When a person is lost in sin and repents and believes in Jesus Christ as Savior, that person is immediately born again. Now, just like when a child is born, the moment that child is born, they're born into a family. Maybe they just have parents. Maybe they're, they're number six out of six kids, and they've got all these siblings. Day one, they have a family. Nobody's born an orphan. It's the same when a person is born again in Christ. That person who trusts Christ for salvation is born into this spiritual family. This is the adoption that we talk about in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, bondage again to fear, but you, re you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This is also very similar to the new birth spoken about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Did you notice that? Everyone who's ever been born again has a living hope in Jesus. Everyone who belongs in Jesus has an inheritance that never fades. You understand that? Who you are in Christ, your inheritance, never fades. What in your life can you point at that never fades, never is tarnished, never diminishes, never loses its strength? There's nothing. Everything wears out. Everything deteriorates. But this, who we are in Christ. Everyone born into this family is secured by Jesus, and everyone who's saved is kept by the power of God until the end. What this means is that if you're born again, you're born again into a spiritual family that will never end. It means you have the same father in the Lord with everyone else who's ever been born again. That means Moses is your brother. Pretty cool. That means every other believer is either your brother or your sister in Christ. And so this familial bond is a bond, but it's not the bond that you would have by being born with the same physical parents. It's a bond that's established in the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed to wash away your sin and provide the means for your adoption. Now here's the beautiful part. If it washes away my sin, then it also washes away your sin. It washes away your brother or your sister's sin in the same way it did yours. And so we can see people who were once our bitter enemies as our beloved family in Christ by whom we're made new and united in his name. None of the social constructs that divide people should divide people who are in Christ. Race, economic status, political affiliation, tribalism, our position in, on cultural issues, vaccination status, all of those divisions dissolve under the shadow of the cross and we are made one people united in Christ of every tribe, every nation, every tongue, yet one in him. Now, if we really believe that, how would, it, how would that impact the United States of America? If, if we really lived like that, how would it impact Stony Ford, California? If we could really grasp this, what would happen to the broken and bitter relationships that we have in our own lives and in our own homes? What wounds would be healed? You see the implications of this? I mean, if I really believe that someone was my brother, or better yet, if I really believe that that person was God's son or she was God's daughter, wouldn't I treat them with the utmost dignity and respect? And if I really believe that their sin is paid for on the cross, wouldn't I put the rocks down that I might otherwise use to stone them with and just embrace them and love them? Because if it was good enough what Jesus did on the cross to satisfy God's wrath, there should be none left of my own. 
And what if I disagreed with that person? What if I thought they were wrong? Wouldn't I still think that they're valuable because they belong to him? Wouldn't I conduct myself more honorably if I, if I really believed that I belong to him? That I'm his son too? The church that loves like family turns the world upside down. And what Jesus prays for in John 17 becomes reality. John 17, 20 and 23 says this. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one. In them and you in me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and love them as you have loved me. The greatest evangelistic force on the planet Earth according to what Jesus just says, is you and I loving each other like family. The world can't comprehend it. He, he says it right here. If we would get this right, the world would know that Jesus was sent of the Father, that he is the Messiah, that he's God in flesh. Remember, Paul addresses this letter to Timothy. Timothy is his friend, his 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 protege. Timothy is also the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Paul wrote another letter to that church, to the church in Ephesus. And as you might expect, there are some parallels. In Ephesians 4, there's this passage that we typically think of in the context of marriage. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? Everybody knows that's a marriage verse. It works in marriage, but not because it's a marriage verse, but because it's God's word and it's good for relationships, but that is, the context is really, really clear. That's, that's not about marriage. That's about the church. When Cynthia and I first got married, a lot of people would give us that sage advice. It's good advice. Don't ever go to bed angry. And it is good advice, but it, it works. It works in marriage because it works in relationships because it works in the church. And when we think about other believers, we should think of them in this light. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your, out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In a family and in a church, there should be open and honest communication. That's essential. So be candid. In a family and in the church, there should be no place for bitterness, bitterness or harsh words, so be under control. In a family and in a church, the unmet needs of one member affect everyone, so be charitable. In a family and in a church, there's lots of things that need to be done and provided for, so be contributing. Be candid, be under control, be charitable, be contributing. Why? Because I belong to you and you belong to me because we belong to Christ. And just like a family, when a church isn't as it should be, it can be one of the greatest sources of pain in somebody's life. Just like a family, when a church is as it should be, it can be among the greatest joys and blessings in this life. So brothers and sisters, united in love for Christ who died to save them, working together for the worship and the renown of Jesus, holding all things in common without rivalry and conceit. That's the goal. That's what we're aiming at. Is that how you see the church? Or is the church an event you attend once a week? 
Is it a building you stop by every now and then? Let me ask you a question. At the risk of being like moving from preaching to meddling. Might meddle a little bit here, okay? Imagine if I only spent an hour a week at my home with my wife and children. How healthy would my marriage be? How healthy would my relationships with my children would be? How, how healthy would they be? They'd be awful, right? You see the problem here in our culture, the people that I go to Sunday school, I go to discipleship group on Wednesday night, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here early and I stay late, and I, I'm at everything faithfully, right? In our culture, we look at those people and go, the super Christian. And it's a grand total of about three and a half hours in a week. But that's super Christian status. The reality is that we live in a culture where the grand majority of believers treat church as though it's an option unless there's something better to do. And, you know, if, if, if the 49ers are playing on the East Coast, you can't go to church because game time kickoffs at 10. we got to understand this. The early church met daily. Not all at once, most likely, but they were in each, in each other's homes and in each other's lives daily to pray, to encourage each other. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we see that we're in even greater need of that kind of closeness than the early church was. It says this, and let us not, excuse me, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. That day is the day of the Lord's return. As we see that day approaching, we should be needing more. Well, by my recollection, it's been ish 2,000 years since that was written. So today we need it more, right? Easy timeline math stuff. Simple. Well, more than what they were doing, and they met daily from house to house, breaking bread together, encouraging each other. Does that mean every time we get together, there's going to be a printed handout and a Bible study every single day? No. It means we're in each other's homes and we're in each other's lives and we're sharing a meal and we're celebrating milestones in the lives of each other's children. And when there's a need or when there's a project, we know who to call. We call our family. We call our brothers and sisters in Christ and they come and there's exhortation and there's encouragement and there's prayer. And we're talking about our faith as though it's a normal part of our everyday existence. It's not this thing where we have to go into spiritual mode. That should be the default setting, my friends. Because we're believers. Because we belong to Christ. The bottom line is the Christian life is hard. And we need each other like we need our families. We need each other because we are family. So Paul teaches us how to conduct ourselves in a God-honoring way by seeing the church as a family. And then he gives this other analogy. He says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, that's family, which is the church of the living God. That's the second analogy. Now you're like, I don't get it. What's an analogy about that? He just says it's the church of the living God. That's super simple. Well, what does church mean? What actually is that? The word church here is trans the translation of the Greek, the Greek word ekklesia. It basically means an assembly or congregation. It's people that are called out from something and, and deliberately coming together. They're called out of their homes to gather in a public place for a common purpose. That's what the word means. We tend to think of the word fellowship as something the church does. We sit around and we eat, right? Fellowship. 
Reality is, fellowship is not what the church does. It's what the church is. We are a fellowship. We are an ecclesia. We are a congregation of people called out of our individual lives and united together for a common purpose. Now, I don't do this often, but I'm going to let my inner nerd show a little bit this morning. Any Tolkien fans here? Lord of the Rings author? Good. Some of you, you're my people. The rest of you can make fun of me later. I can take it. All right? Tolkien wrote a series of books that were later turned into films called The Lord of the Rings. You've heard of this, The Hobbit? Okay? In The Lord of the Rings, there's this group of people that are assembled for a common purpose. Ordinarily, these people wouldn't associate because they're from very different, I mean, they're not even the same actual like species. They're not all human. There's some men, and then there's some hobbits, and then there's some dwarves, and there's some elves, and these, these people don't live the same, don't look the same, don't talk the same, don't smell the same, you know, dwarves. You can make fun of them because they're not real, and they're not here, so. They wouldn't ordinar ordinarily interact. But this fellowship forms for a common purpose. And all of a sudden, these people band together around that purpose. All of the differences melt away, and they're willing to die for each other and the cause. Now, in the books, it's to destroy evil by getting rid of the source of its power and throwing the ring into Mount Doom. And yeah, but let's not stretch the analogy further than it's intended, okay? This group, what are they called? The Fellowship of the Ring. They're trying to do this thing together. They are a fellowship. They have a job. They have a mission that they're trying to accomplish. Now, this is similar to what the church is. We're called out of our individual lives to gather, to join together for a common purpose. And the one who calls us, the one who assembles us, he gets to define our purpose. The church is a fellowship in that it's an assembly of people called out of darkness into the light of the gospel who now exist to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, and three days later rose again. We gather to proclaim that message to a world lost in darkness, being tossed and torn by the enemy. The good news in our fellowship is that that enemy is already defeated. Our king is already on the throne. But notice whose fellowship it is. Our text says it's the church, the ecclesia, the fellowship, the assembly of the living God. It's his fellowship. It's his church. He's called us together to maintain the praise of his name on the earth until he returns. And he's called us together to make disciples of every people group. He's called us to share the good news of the gospel. And he's laid out this structure of how this fellowship should be governed. Now, church governance is a sticky issue, right? Because we all want to import our ideas of how it should be done. And think, well, it, you know, it should be more democratic because we borrow things from our culture. Or, or no, it should just be, you know, this, this top down where the pastor's the boss and he tells everybody what to do because we import things from our culture and we like to envision ourselves as little kings. You know? One pastor announced on a Sunday there'll be a meeting of the church board immediately after the service. And at the close of the service, the church board gathered at the back of the sanctuary for the announced meeting, but there was a stranger in their midst. A visitor. He'd never attended the church before. And the pastor said, my friend, didn't you understand that this is a meeting of the church board? And he said, yeah. And after today's sermon, I suppose I'm as bored as anybody else. <laughs> Don't amen that. <laughs> the reason this gets difficult, like I said, is because we as a people like to import our ideas of how to run a business or another organization onto the church. We as a people want to dictate to God how his organization should be governed. Let me just say really quickly, he's a much better manager of his organization than we are. We'll mess it up. So he's going to tell us how to run it. It's his organization. It's his church. And in the Bible, we see those instructions, don't we? He says, appoint qualified men as elders 
to minister and care for the souls of people. We see instructions for entrusting practical ministries to faithful workers, godly men, godly women, so that the needs, those practical needs of people are met without the elders being taken from the tasks to which they've been appointed. Now, if the church is really the fellowship of the living God, as we've read here, then who are we to defy what he said and structure it any other way? Jonathan Men does a lot of missions work in Africa and in training pastors there. He made two observations about the church belonging to God, about it being his organization. He says, first, this reinforces the notion that the church is a family, not a building. As Stephen pointed out, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. That's Acts 7.48. Instead, he's a living God who dwells in a living people. We gather together in his name, and he's in our midst. Second, as the living God, he imparts life to his people. We're to walk in newness of life. This means we're to stop living like worldly, unregenerate people. But we're to lay aside the old self and the old ways and put on the new self and the new way of living. Only by living like the loving family we're supposed to be do we show the world and ourselves the truth that God is a living God and we are his people. Because the church is a fellowship with a structure of governance that God gets to define, there's an accountability that comes with being part of it. We're to hold each other accountable for living like the new creatures that we are. The Bible tells us what that looks like, and it tells us how that accountability and, and, and that discipline works. <laughs> But when we see the church as a fellowship, instead of a building or, or a weekly meeting, we better understand that like the fellowship of the ring, the church has a job to do. It has a mission. Now, if you were to look on the front of your bulletin, you'd see how we have sort of summarized and boiled down ours. We exist to glorify God and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, as simplified and summarized as it can possibly get without losing meaning. The Great Commandment that Jesus gives in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Glorify God. The Great Commission that Jesus gives in Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Put that together. Why do we exist? To glorify God and to make disciples. And if we aren't doing that, we're not on mission. If we aren't doing that, we're not on task. If we aren't doing that, we're not functioning as the fellowship that he has called us together to be. And we're being disobedient. So I ask you, actually verbally respond. Why? The Stony Ford Community Church exists to glorify God and make disciples. Well, if that's why we exist, then everything we do should be trained and aimed at that. Everything. Otherwise, we drift off course. We spend time, energy, resources on things that don't matter, according to what we, why we say we exist which is, I believe, in line with the purpose that God has called us together for. That's why we print it on the front of our bulletin. We put it before our eyes every time we gather. That's why it's on our website. That's why it's on t-shirts. That's the purpose of our fellowship. Think of it as our war cry. Why do we exist? To glorify God and make disciples. That's worship and evangelism and discipleship all smashed into one. What should motivate lives of worship? Love for God who saved us. What should motivate our evangelism? Love for God who saved us. You know what else? If we really love the God who saved us and somebody's not worshiping him, then the God we love is not being worshiped as we ought to, and that should grieve us. It should bother us. 
When's the last time you woke up in the middle of the night and you thought of your unsaved friend, neighbor, family member, whoever it is, and you're like, man, God's not being worshipped in that person's life, and that bothers me. They're robbing God of the honor he's due, and that grieves my soul. I need to see them saved so that God is glorified as he ought to be. That should be our motivation. You know what's a poor motivation? Butts and seats. Big crowds. More money in the offering box. Those things are byproducts of the right motivation. And if you put it in the wrong order, you get one without the other. And unless God is being glorified in our midst, what's the point of all the other stuff? Join a country club. It's more fun. Maybe. But if we put glorifying God first, we've accomplished our purpose, and we get all these other things too. So we see the church as a family. We see, we see the church as a fellowship. It's what it is. That's what we're gathered for. Third, the church is a fortress. I'm not talking about a physical building, this building, that building. None of these buildings are the church, but the church is a fortress. The Apostle Paul writes, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Pillar and ground, these words work together to form an image. It should be on the screen, I'm not sure. Do we have that next image? Perfect, thank you. This is an image that should help us understand the pillar and the ground of truth. This is what the church is ought to be. First of all, we should define what the truth is. This is the truth of the Bible. It's the truth of God's word. It's the truth of the gospel. Verse 16 actually clarifies for anybody who might wonder. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. You want to summarize the New Testament? There it is. Now, this phrase, this verse 16, was likely a hymn sung by the early church. It beautifully summarizes God's plan of redemption being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the God-man, came in flesh, died on the cross for the sins of the world. He was vindicated and being raised to life again on the third day. And he's brought to the knowledge of rational beings, both angels and humans, who have no excuse for not worshiping him. That's what we exist to hold high. When we think of a pillar. We think of the ground of truth. There's this image. But the church in our culture doesn't look like this. It looks like a lot of other stuff. When churches become overly focused on being culture, culturally relevant, they become a parody of cultural ideology. When churches become overly focused on the traditions of the past, well, just like Richard Hayes said on, what was it, Thursday night, fr Friday night, they become museums. You become a relic of a, of a bygone age. When churches become performance-driven, where we just try to fill the seats with a good show, we look a lot more like a theater than a fortress. The theater is full of spectators sitting and consuming rather than the vibrant fellowship of missional people. Churches can become political stumps too, right? Where the gospel of Jesus Christ gets diluted with the agenda of any political party. My friends, all of these are cancers that consume more and more and more of the life and the vitality of the church that's ours in Christ if we would understand who we're meant to be. So we see this image. It's none of those things. It's not a theater. 
It's not a museum. It's a fortress. A pillar is raised high for all to see. Paul says the church is the ground of truth. This, this word is derived from the word that means immovable. It has a foundation. It's a bulwark. It has a defensive element that would keep attackers out. It's like a fortified city. So it's a pillar and it's, it's a ground. It's a bulwark. Together, these words paint a picture of a well-fortified fortress that's well defended but still set high for all to see. There's a great parallel to this in the Sermon on the Mount. In speaking to his disciples in Matthew 5, Jesus says this, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Salt is a preservative. It, def it defends against decay. It prevents things from being corrupted by disease. It fortifies in the same way that the church should be this fortifying impact in the culture. As the ground of truth, the, the church should be a moral and spiritual stay in a culture drifting more and more into corruption. But then Jesus says that believers are the light of the world, a city on a hill. It should give light and demonstrate the way for all to see, just like a pillar set high. Our church building is actually a pretty good image of this when you think about it. It's pretty cool when you think about the steeple on the peak of our roof. Isn't that about the tallest structure in town? Can you think of anything taller? There's nothing taller right here immediately in town. And what's at the top of it? The cross. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, this building has stood for well over 100 years. It was established in what? Does anybody know the year off the top of their head? 1898. That's when the building was finished. 1898. Has a good foundation then, doesn't it? It's on a firm foundation. It's, it's well fortified. It's not going to fall down, but yet it rises high for all of the sea. The message we proclaim here and the lives of people here should serve to see God glorified and disciples made here in our community. But we got to understand this building, this structure, whatever building you want, that's not the church. We are. And in this passage, we see that carrying out this purpose of glorifying God and making disciples is directly linked to our proper understanding of what the church is. It's not a social club. It's not a once a week theater production. It's the family of God. It's the fellowship of God. It's the pillar and the ground of truth. It's the fortress of God where we gather to throw down what is false and hold up high what is true. The gospel that Jesus died for sinners he was buried and rose again, and that he's the only one who saves and gives life. That's the truth we hold high. And we guard against anything else that gets in the way. Church life is simple. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's easy. Living it out is hard, but it's simple. It's you and me, us together. Living our lives together, united with a singular purpose to see Jesus exalted in all things until he returns or calls us home. That's church life. It's really that simple. And we all need more of it. So for each of us, we should be asking ourselves, how healthy is my foundation? Is my life, my marriage, the way I parent, the way I work, is that founded on... The gospel? Is my life holding high the truth of the gospel for all to see? Or am I holding up an example of somebody who's got one foot in the boat and one foot on the shore? 
What in your life needs to be thrown off because it hinders your walk with Christ? What are those areas of compromise and decay that need to be fortified again? Let's work toward a close with a couple points of application. One, recognize the authority of Christ. If the church is a family, the Lord's our Father. And if the church is a fellowship, then Christ is our captain. He's the one in control, and since he's the head of the church, not pastors, not deacons, not influential members, not committees of people, since Christ is the head of the church, Christ gets to say how and why it exists. And he tells us, love like family. It's not optional. It's a command. By the authority of Jesus, love each other like family. Our job is to love like family. The people that make up our church are our family. They're our brothers and our sisters. We're to love them. We're to love them deeply. We're to love them sacrificially. We're to love them unconditionally. So how can you love someone like family this week? Maybe it's inviting them into your home for a meal. Maybe it's coming alongside them and helping them with a project. Maybe it's finding a way to make sure their needs are met. And the great thing about being in a small church is that we can be as close-knit as we want to be because the size of the ministry doesn't hinder, doesn't hinder its intimacy. When we recognize the Lord's authority, it's a lot easier to love people like family because he's declared every other Christian as not guilty and acceptable to him. So if they're not guilty and acceptable to him, you know who else they should be not guilty and acceptable to? us. He's adopted us as his children. And he's dealt with our sin. So what's left is for us to love each other the way he loves us. Second in that, recognizing his authority, live like fellow citizens. Again, that's a command. Because we're a fellowship, the Lord is our king. We serve at the pleasure of our king. He, he determines our mission. He determines the strategy. He determines the outcome. How freeing is that? The outcome isn't dependent on you. Your job is to be faithful. He'll take care of the results. You don't have to worry about them. Those of you serving in different capacities, leading kids club or adult Bible study, the amount of people that show up, all, all how people receive it, don't worry about it. The results are up to him. Our job is faithfulness. Our job is to stand shoulder to shoulder and shield to shield with our brothers and sisters in Christ and march when he says march. The outcome's something he'll determine. My uncle used to run rafting boats on the Sacramento and American Rivers. And as a guide, I have a picture. It's not him, but it's just a generic rafting picture. As a guide, his job began with training people, many of whom have never been whitewater rafting before. Anybody been whitewater rafting? He would go through this whole spiel where he'd, he'd tell the people what the different commands would mean and... And that, you know, this is what you need to do in order to navigate this boat safely. But the one command that he made sure everybody knew, you have an oar, you must paddle. Or you can't be in the boat. Everybody in the boat gets an oar. Everybody paddles. And I think that's a wonderful analogy of the church. You're in the, you're in the boat. You have an oar, you paddle. And some people are going to paddle on the right, and some people are going to paddle on the left, and some people are going to wait to paddle until just the right moment. And some people are going to sit in the back and do a whole lot of work. And some people are going to make sure that front of the boat doesn't come up. They're just there to be a weight, but they have, they have an oar in case they're needed. And everybody rows. We're fellow citizens. We're working together. Something fundamentally changes in our thought process when we see the church as a fellowship. That we're not here to be served as though it were a pleasure cruise. We're all 
the boat with oars. We're not consumers, we're contributors. Everyone can do something to contribute to the fellowship in carrying out its mission. Everyone. Second point of application, represent the name of Christ. Represent him well. Hold his reputation on high in your life. Not only in your words, but in your actions. Live in a way that demonstrates the gospel. Live according to scripture. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Colossians 1.18 and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And all things he may have preeminence. And what things should Christ be preeminent? All of them? You know that Greek word, you know what it means? All of them. And what things should Christ reign supreme? All of them. Anything that's included in all things is something where Christ should rule and reign in our lives to demonstrate his power through us. So let's hold that truth on high in our lives as though we were to be pillars of this truth. Grow in your knowledge of his word. Strengthen that foundation. And continue in it until he returns for us. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the privilege of being able to proclaim it publicly. Lord, we thank you for a, a land where we're still free to do that. Lord, help us not to see the church as a place that we gather to be entertained or encouraged or uplifted, but something where we have each individual a, a vital role to see it as a family a people that we love sacrificially and unconditionally in the same way that you've loved us God help us to be people that proclaim the good news that Jesus died for sinners that there's salvation and no one else but that salvation is available to anyone who will call upon his name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather. We pray that you would continue to unite us together as a body. That you'd help us to function well. To carry out the purpose you've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing the doxology now as we